We just want to welcome you to the Loma Linda University Church Sabbath School time. We've got a lot to talk about, so we're going to go right into it. We're going to start with a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we want to thank you for your word. Be with our conversation today, and thank you for the many blessings in your name. Amen. Now, before we get into discussion, let's take a look at this great mission story. In 1912, the Titanic sank. Istanbul was part of the Ottoman Empire and the Adventist Church introduced a new way to advance mission. The very first 13 Sabbath offerings supported early mission work in India. More than a hundred years later, Adventists around the world have contributed to hundreds of projects, from building schools to launching mission boats. Countless lives worldwide have been transformed by the generous giving to this offering each quarter. Spicer Adventist University in India has benefited from the 13 Sabbath offering several times. The school has a rich history of teaching and training students for a higher purpose. In addition to the standard curriculum, Spicer's holistic education helps students grow academically, physically, and spiritually. Diversity is celebrated with students coming from almost every state in India, as well as other countries. The campus is nestled in the city of Pune on a 60-acre campus with plenty of green space to explore and find peace from the busyness of everyday life. In the evening, students gather on the soccer field, the perfect place to unwind after class. Thanks to 13 Sabbath offerings, the university has been able to construct a science complex and currently offers several undergraduate and graduate programs in the field of science. In 1969, the offering helped build new dormitories. A few decades later, another women's dorm and married student housing. Jessica is a Spicer student who found comfort and refuge at the university. Spicer is, uh, is my only hope where I can study about God so I can learn more about him and can share to my family. I like the people around here. They are very, uh, very friendly and uh, they are helpful. And I like also uh, the surrounding. It is, a, it is a spiritual place. Teachers strive to create a family-like atmosphere in the classroom and build strong bonds with students. Here in Spicer, the teachers are very close to us, the way how uh, they love us like their, their their own son, and of course the food here, <laughs> the food here is different, and Spicer provide uh, different kinds of food where we cannot get in other university, and they give opportunity for the students to share their ideas, and they were op they are open. The teachers are open, and the people around here are very good. Students and faculty at Spicer Adventist University want to thank you for supporting the 13th Sabbath offering. Thanks to God's blessing and your faithful giving, these projects have helped thousands of students receive training to serve God. Please pray for this campus. Pray that God will continue to use Spicer Adventist University for a higher purpose. Thank you for supporting the 13th Sabbath offering. A hundred years of giving, a hundred years of experiencing, a hundred years of connecting. Thirteen Sabbath offerings allow for education and other missional goals to become realities in the four corners of the earth. So if we haven't said it, let's say it again. Thank you for your generosity and thank you for your faithfulness. Walt Whitman, that famous American poet, once penned a poem that continues to move the heart. 
the opening lines of his masterpiece read like this. O captain, my captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rock. The price we sought is won. Whitman's words have become famous for their cameo in a movie that was debuted in 1989, a movie starring Robin Williams as a poetry professor at Welton Academy, a private school in New England. The title of the film is The Dead Poets Society. And the place in the narrative where Whitman's words become central is at the end of the movie. It is almost an homage to William's character as he is asked to leave teaching. His students, in one final act of defiance towards the institution and towards unfairness and injustice, decide to stand and recite Whitman's poem. It is a moving moment because it is the moment of a farewell. And it is that notion, that feeling that begins to grow in the pit of your stomach as you say farewell to someone that gives us our starting point for our study time, the Sabbath. John chapter 14. John chapter 14 that has been called a testament piece by most New Testament scholars. It's a testament piece that reminds the reader of the long discourses uttered by the patriarchs. Think about Israel's depiction of wealth and wisdom as he departs this earth in Genesis chapter 48. It is at that moment where he bequeaths his worldly possessions and divides them among his family. Now, as we get to John 14, the language might be similar, but the reality lived by the audience is much different. For Jesus has no real worldly possessions. What he has is peace, and that's what he would gift us. In this farewell speech where the master teacher is able to compound all of the lessons that he yearns his disciples to have, the final grade that will determine how well you did on the exam is, do you have peace? I want to read a part of the text to you before we enter into more substantive discussion. I would like the words to just wash over you, to hear them in the same way that the disciples heard them all that time ago. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in me, trust, trust in me. My father's house has plenty of room if that were not so. Would I have told you? But I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where we are going. How can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe in me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe in the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, all who have faith in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. I want to 
have you pause for the briefest of moments and imagine yourself a part of that conversation, that last lesson. As the professor is getting ready to leave this earth and you are trying to hear his words, he is trying desperately to summarize the content and the context of his teachings. And then you hear it. You hear the opening statement in this testament piece, do not let your heart be troubled. Now, it's a really interesting thing that happens when you read it in the original language. Do not let your, plural, heart, singular, be troubled. So what is Jesus doing at the very outset? What is the first lesson that he wants to teach us in this Testament passage? Well, my friend, it's quite simple. Jesus is saying this. You, as a collective Christian body, possess one heart. And that means that we are all in this together, this journey of learning and this moment in which we all crave and yearn for peace is a shared experience. You are part of me and I am part of you, much in the same way that Whitman's poem causes sailors to recognize their captain the one who has led them on a fantastic voyage and to do it corporately. Jesus is asking the church to corporately believe. And this word is central to John's gospel. The notion of belief, I mean, it appears an astounding 98 times throughout the gospel. Believe, 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 believe. And the idea of belief is always connected to this other idea, the idea of having faith. And in both these cases, belief and faith are never, in John's gospel, a noun. They're always a verb. Because trust, faith, and belief are dynamic. And this is what Jesus wants us to understand. That our shared experiences, that our corporate sentiments, that our call to have faith, peace, and trust is to be experienced in a dynamic context. Which leads me to the first connection that I'd like to make with the process of education. Namely this, education requires trust. Think about the teachers that most impacted your life. I can guarantee that their lessons exceeded simple lesson plans or courses. I bet you that the teachers that most profoundly impacted you are teachers in whom you trusted, teachers with whom you had a dynamic relationship, because learning itself, our didactic processes ought to be dynamic. And Jesus understands that, and so he tells his disciples, believe. My father's house has plenty of room. Now, I remember having a tournament that we were to play when I was in high school. It was a soccer tournament. And one of my friends who was on the team had invited us to stay over at his house. He had a house that was much closer to the pitch where the tournament was to be played. So the professors agreed. It was 18 of us, and in the back of our minds, we were always thinking, is there going to be enough space? Are we going to all fit? Where are we going to sleep? In bunk beds? On the living room floor? We asked my friend, is there enough space for us? And he didn't commit. He said, yeah, I think think we'll be okay. Now, I thought that my friend lived in an ordinary house in an ordinary neighborhood, so I was astounded to see the size of his home. This was no ordinary home. It was his father's house. It was a mansion full of corridors and rooms, places that could accommodate not only our team but several others. My friend trusted that there would be enough space for us because he knew his father's home. Jesus is in the same way asking the disciples to place not only his trust, their trust in him, but also to recognize that there is always space in the father's home. And so it's this great moment of 
an exchange of not only trust, but visions that are intended to generate hope. If you trust in Jesus and you believe, you dare to dream of the fact that there is a heavenly mansion where there, where there is a room allocated specifically for you, then hope follows. Which is why it's so shocking to have what we see at the beginning of verse 5. In comes Thomas, the Eeyore of the group. He begins to mutter and he says, we don't even know where we're going. How can we know the way? And throughout John's Gospels, the disciples have been truly a contrasting character in which you have hope and the highest appreciation of who God is collide with exhaustion. Have you ever been that exhausted? Have you ever been tired enough that you don't really care to make decisions anymore. You have no emotional energy to even decide. This is where the disciples are. They are living in the realm of exhausted expectation and they don't want to make decisions. We don't know the way. We are pleading ignorance. How can you tell us that you are going to prepare a place for us? Here's the reality. The reality is that anything that is worth achieving requires discipline. Picture the mother who day after day goes to work. She is single and she has a family to feed. She has dreams, hopes, and aspirations. And it is those dreams, those hopes, those aspirations that push her to continue working even in the midst of exhaustion. Or picture the college student, tired, sleepy, getting ready to embark on another all-nighter, a journey that will connect him with concepts and ideas that up to a few hours ago remained foreign, he does this to achieve a degree. And things that matter require discipline. And so Jesus is asking his disciples to just push forward, push through the exhaustion. The second lesson then that Jesus wants to teach as it pertains to education is that one must push forward exhausted expectation in order to renew hope. Our educational processes are nothing if they don't imbue us with the ideas of a new future, a new calling for our lives and for how we can contribute to make this world a better place. But we're not done. You see, Jesus will answer with this certainty, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes through the Father except through me. And it seems that as Jesus gives this latest statement of faith, the conversation should be settled. But in comes Philip. In the Gospel of John, Philip is no minor character. He appears 12 times, far superseding any uh, cameo he makes in any of the synoptic Gospels. Remember, it is Philip who brings the first convert to Jesus. It is Philip who makes the first statement about the Messiah. We have found him, Philip will say. And now Philip will perch up again and ask a question. He will say, Father, show, show us the Father, Jesus, and we will believe. The Greek word for belief that Philip used is archeo. It appears only one other time in the gospel and it is uttered in a conversation that Jesus is having with Philip. When the bread and the fish are to be multiplied, Philip will come and say, is it enough so that we may be satisfied, so that we may be our hell? And Jesus will tell him that what he gives not only will satisfy us, but will supersede our hunger. And again, now Philip is asking for satisfaction. Show us the Father and I will be satisfied. Interestingly enough, Jesus responds to Thomas's query by 
referencing and speaking to the whole disciples, the answers are plural. But in the case of Philip, the ans- Jesus switches from plural to singular. He says, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And what Jesus is actually trying to say is that it's time we stop moving from a theology of scarcity. This is what we do. We always decide to engage in this theology of scarcity. Lord, we need you to satisfy us because we don't have enough. And when we depart from the premise of scarcity, what follows is always a competition for satiation. You are constantly hoping, praying, wishing that you can be satiated. And if you see scarcity as a problem, of having things you don't yet possess, you see then the tools that can be used to satiate that hunger, to provide satisfaction as limited. And what ensues always is a competition, a competition to be the best. And the problem of scarcity is not only one that is pertinent to our theology, our educational systems sometimes also part from pedagogical scarcity. In other words, there's only enough information, there's only enough teaching, there's only enough places at a university or a professional school, and so we must compete. And Jesus moves us away from this idea of scarcity to an idea of fullness. If anyone has seen me, he has seen the Father. But he's not done yet. He asks again for the disciples to believe. He pushes them to this idea of faith and trust. And after he is done, he then says, Don't you know that whoever keeps my words will be able to do great things? In this moment, Jesus will link words and works together. Because what we do ought to be a faithful exponent of who we believe in. Principle number three in education. Our theories, our language, our ideas mean nothing if they cannot be carried out in the realm of flesh and blood. Words and works linked and what, what is the work and the word that Jesus tries to give his disciples as he concludes this testament teaching, this last will, this bequeathing of peace? What is he trying to have us understand? He's, he will famously say, a new commandment I give you. It's just preceded this pericope, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So it all comes back. It all comes back to love. William Sloan Coffin famously stated that if we fail at love, we fail at everything else. Which leads us to the fourth and final principle of education of true education that we can learn from the master teacher. Success, success is determined when purpose is carried out with passion. We We must not only love each other, we must love what we do. Because loving what we do inspires. And it, it will someday inspire us to stand tall, puff out our chest, and say, O Captain, O Captain. Stu, let's talk about Jesus as our master teacher. Well, right off the bat, the let not your heart be troubled, if there couldn't, there couldn't be a more relevant kind of starting statement under current circumstances like you to unpack that a little bit in terms of 
one of the things I, I find in my own Christian experience, and it, it seems like it resonates with some other people, that's a very simple expression, let not your heart be troubled. Yet we often are troubled. Why do you think it's so difficult for us to internalize that? Because obviously the disciples were struggling with it as well. But why is it so difficult for us to struggle with that? I think, I think it's one of the basic principles of, of just being human. Um, and that is that our thoughts impact our feelings. And our feelings determine our state. Now think about what the disciples are thinking at this moment. They have joined Jesus on this mission, on this kingdom mission. And all throughout that journey, Jesus has been preparing them for the understanding that this kingdom mission is going to look far different than what they had anticipated. At this point, they're beginning to understand that there might not be a coronation, that what lies ahead is a cross. And that, I am assuming, is bringing them very negative thoughts, thoughts of that link to their self-worth, to their position, to what they have given up. And that uh, thinking process um, is, I think, creating this wrestling inside and this, as Jesus puts it, the, the troubled heart. And so I think one of the things that Jesus is trying to do is he's trying to ask them to combat a troubled heart with trust. And the trust is that the vision that God has is greater. And so he's trying to say, think about that vision. Think about mansions in heaven. Think about the fact that once I leave, the good news is the comforter is coming and the comforter will embolden you to do greater things. And so I think what uh, what the statement is trying to say, not only to the disciples, but to us, is to question some of those thoughts that creep in and produce very negative feelings. Well, one of the things I like about that particular text and other pla- places, Christ is clearly, including with other things, clearly setting the disciples up for what's going to happen. Because it, it, it's always amazed me how Christ even just flat out came out, said what was going to happen, and they didn't hear that. And I know, at least in my experience, you know, at first you kind of start, how could they not hear that? But as you kind of travel with your journey with Christ yourself, you realize sometimes how tense or how obvious some things are, and you just don't, aren't listening or, or receptive. But I find it interesting, let not your heart be troubled. And then, of course, the disciples go into this great crisis when you mentioned like the cross. And I've more recently, I've, I've, I've kind of spent the time thinking about what would I have felt like? There's all this great ant- anticipation. The story is great. You know, he's feeding the 5,000. This is happening. This is happening. And then, wait a minute, what, what happened? How did we... <laughs> Talk about the great disappointment. But then when you, there seems to be evidence, like when they look back and look at all the words that Jesus told them, let not heart, your heart be troubled and all the many other things. And I imagine that even included remembering him saying something was going to happen. That ultimately was a profound life transformation aspect to be able to look back at those things. Another thing, kind of moving topics, this let your heart let not your heart be troubled. For me, I, I find that a challenge, but I also find it so vital. Christ does not want us to be anxious. Um, he wants us to place our trust in him. And we can't place trust in someone unless we have some knowledge of them. Christ isn't asking us to blindly trust. Now, one of the things that I found interesting while you were talking about this is the connection with the father. You know, Philip comes in and says, well, hey, can you show us the father? 
And why I, I find that kind of interesting is I've mentioned this before, but it feels as though we tend to look at Christ and God as kind of the good cop, bad cop right. scenario. And I find it really important that Jesus ties those two together. You see me, you see the Father, we're the same. Can you comment about that a little bit, Miguel? Yeah, it's 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 I think the only way that you can that you can trust. Um, and what I what I love about about this particular passage is he begins by this petition, right? Trust in me. Um, my in my father's house there are many mansions, and I am going to send you a comforter. And in that moment, you have the briefest snapshot of the Godhead working. Um, Jesus, God made human, asking his disciples, I think, the most human thing that one can ask in any interpersonal relationship, trust me. And then Philip saying, well, we know you, show us the Father. And Jesus saying, do you, do, Philip, do you think I'm here of my own volition or accord? I'm here because the Father and I are one. The purposes and the plans, that desire that God has to free you from the constraints of whatever issue you are wrestling with is the same. It's Jesus and the Father working in conjunction for your liberation, for your peace, for your education. And then um, as you begin to relate to Jesus, because it's the easiest way we can relate to the Father, you begin to get, get glimpses of the God who created the world and spoke everything you see into existence, and you recognize that they're the same one. And then, then the question, well, how, how do I relate to a Jesus that is no longer here, to a Jesus that has ascended, and Christ again says, I am going to send you the paracletos, the comforter, the advocate, the advisor, the spirit. And so John 14 is this moment in which you have these three people in the Godhead. And the language that Jesus uses to define that relationship is abide. It's that I live in, in the Father and the Father dwells in me. Here's what's really wonderful. You today are being asked to participate in that dynamic relationship because John's word, abide, the same word that Jesus uses to describe the connection between him and the Father will appear later on in the gospel as pertaining to your relationship with Jesus. Abide in me. And so it's not only the idea that the Father the Spirit and the Son are working for your liberation from whatever ails you, but it's the fact that you are being now invited to participate in that relationship of redemption. One of the things I, I really, kind of, kind of continuing what you just mentioned, one of the things that really resonates with me more and more is Christ as an educator one of the classic ways of educating is modeling. And we've talked and I've given examples where things in my kids, they do more because they saw me do it, not because I told them to do it. Well, Christ, one of the things he modeled was kind of this servant leadership. And I just envision at the, the narrative that talks about the Last Supper where Jesus is watch, washing the disciples' feet that goes so contrary to our our models of, of leadership. We, we tend to keep wanting to put someone over someone, and we understand there's some structural things, but this servant leadership, and, and the reason I bring that up in this context is coming back to this, this response, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, I think there's so much written, richness that we need to explore how this collaboration between Christ and his Father and the Holy Spirit, how this works. It feels, going back to kind of this good cop, bad cop, it, it almost feels like there's this sense that Jesus had to die to appease God, his Father. Instead, this was a collaborative decision on how 
how to deal with sin in general for eternity. And this is a very close, collaborative dynamic. And I think it has, in talking about Jesus being a great educator, I think there's some great lessons about leadership and how we should spiritually lead and interact with each other. We keep wanting to go to more of a worldly model that someone's above or below or someone's better or lesser, where the Son of God himself is washing the disciples' feet. And then that model, he's saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How do you think that might change our our way we relate to each other when we realize Jesus is the exact replica, replica as God the Father. Yeah. Um, and that, I think, was what was most difficult for the church to grapple with. So do you know that the first real tensions and heresies in the church had to do with the nature of Christ? Who was this Jesus? And um, it was all about... This one little letter, um, we sometimes use um, the term in English now, there's not one iota of a difference. Well, that term comes from from this Christian clash over what actually determines Jesus' true nature. Is he of the same substance as the Father? Or is he a created being? What is this Jesus? And so, the church together came and said, Jesus is of the is made of the very, and it's a very classical way of understanding. We actually, I think, now have better language. But back then they said, no, no, he is the exact same substance of the Father now made flesh. And if this is the case, then these whole ideas of atonement uh, to placate God's wrath kind of begin to fall by the wayside. One of my favorite songs, On Christ the Solid Rock, um, has just one line that I wish we could remove from our collective consciously, uh, consciousness. Uh, the song will say, and on that day when Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. That I don't think is helpful because if Jesus in John 14 is telling us the truth, then he didn't need to perish in order to satisfy the Father. The Father himself was hanging on that cross with Jesus. It was the same substance. The Father himself knelt before the disciples and washed the feet of mere fishermen. And the Father and the Son are one. And sometimes we um, begin to try and define what this relationship in in the Trinity does instead of uh, trying to understand how dynamic it is. Um, And I think any education, back to this topic of education, any educational process that we want to employ in advance must begin with service. When the teacher humbles himself and serves his students, um, it is, I think, the maximum expression of Christian education. Yeah, and talk about educator, you know, Jesus was such uh, a compassionate and humble um, and loving. He modeled what loving education, because he certainly encountered, imagine the feeling from a human perspective, you know, it's like, I've been with you so long and you still don't get it. You know, you, you kind of feel, um, at least we would, that's how we would feel it. In fact, I think when we read that, that's kind of what, what we're, we're, we read into it. And, and, you know, when you dig deeper, it's a little more than that. Jesus isn't just criticizing them. There, there is a compassion there. But he is pointing out something. And I, I just think this idea that Jesus is the greatest educator, it, it moves me to the the fundamental thing, no matter what we pursue in this life, it starts with Jesus and that whole relationship with God. Um, you referenced purpose, um, purpose and passion, ultimately success. And I think one of the big questions in our, our society for, for a lot of people, particularly the younger generation, is finding purpose. And the farther you separate separate from any kind of God um, kind of framework, it seems it can get more difficult. 
or I would say even in a lot of the things that people decide to commit their lives to, which are great things, and they may not be religiously motivated, but they seem to ultimately sometimes or often not satisfy because ultimately, if there's any really change, at least from my perspective, if there's really going to be any change, we're dependent on the great educator, Jesus and his Father, the Holy Spirit. That's just, that's how change happens. And it seems so much that in Christ's ministry with his disciples, he was just modeling this constant humble humility here to serve and here to just patiently teach. And even though there's a strong resistance or just it seems like it takes them so long to get it. I've been around teachers that do not have the patience to teach, and they're not great. It's not fun to be in a class like that, especially when you have students that are struggling. You can just tell they just don't have time for them, and it kind of creates this environment. Whereas Christ modeled this patience, um, graciousness, and Again, I think it has such huge implications of how we relate to one another, especially when we see others not measuring up to either our standard or even something that we know to be God's standard. How we relate to them, we tend to judge or look down, whereas what would it, what would it look like if we always approached from a servant leadership? How would that, and how, how would you describe imagining if we approached mistakes from other people, if we were approaching it from a, a servant leadership, how do you think that would change some of our experiences, Miguel? Yeah, so Stu, you mentioned the word student, uh, servant leader, and I think that's, that's a word now that has been coined by a lot of people who look at uh, leadership and, and what, what that entails. And um, it, it, the idea of servant leadership... Um, is moves its foci a bit. Uh, before, the whole purpose of a leader was to accomplish a task. The purpose of servant leadership, as, as I've read and as has been stated, isn't simply to accomplish a task. That's a byproduct. The real purpose of ser stu uh, servant leadership is to inspire people to follow you. And so it's, it's more inspiration-oriented rather than task-oriented. Now think about how that works in a relationship with someone else. Um, if you approach uh, any relationship that you have, not with the desire of transforming people or of getting people to do what you want to do, which is a lot of the times how we approach relationships, right? Relationships in, in our mind are merely transactional uh, often. And what if these relationships, you, you are now approaching them not, not as transactional, but as inspirational. In other words, I am going to put so much care into who you are as a person that I am going to inspire you to change. And it seems to me that that would do two things. It would cause us to have relationships that are not as acrimonious as some of the relationships we have, but it also would elicit change far more rapidly than, than we have been, have been seeing. And so this, this concept of, of servant leadership keeps popping up, um, and it pops up in the writings of people who are looking at Scripture precisely because God's primary desire for us is not merely accomplishing a task, it's to inspire you. Um, yeah, man, that's, that's so profound, I think, and so useful. And if we could just internalize it, if I could just internalize that. Because you think about how many challenges we, negative experiences we have in this world, and it's related to not a servant attitude, but trying to maintain a status or a, a position or something. Rather than giving of ourselves, we, we, we're, we're feeling more of a need to protect ourselves. And yeah. Jesus certainly modeled a, a, a thing where the God of our universe, our creator, made himself extremely vulnerable and allowed, you know, basically his creation to crucify him which, you know, that, that just kind of blows, blows me away. 
As we're kind of wrapping up here a little bit, one of the things that's is really a, a burden on my heart in relation to this particular le- lesson is kind of going back to that, let not your heart be troubled and just trusting in God and, and then connecting it to this, this, this relationship that Jesus has with his Father, that it, it, it is a model of collaboration, of equal equality, equalness, that they're working together, that this this idea where you just mentioned inspire, I think it's so helpful for us to realize that that the goal, the priority isn't just the end goal. It, it is kind of the process through that that can be so meaningful. And what make me what it reminds me of is when I was younger particularly, you know, you'd hear sermons or these impassioned sermons about, you know, we need to serve, we need to to witness and all this kind of stuff. And I think a lot of people out there, if they were honest with themselves, could relate with myself. I did a lot of those things because I just plain felt guilty. Yeah. And so really the service was ultimately for me, not the in person. And the only way that can change is that we go to the great educator that says, let not your heart be troubled, trust in me to evoke that humility and that compassion, that not selfish passion, but um, selfless passion to serve others. It just, it seems like it revolutionized the church. It would revolutionize our eyes, our, our lives, I should say. It's just, it's so basic, but so significant. And it seems like, why do you think it's so difficult for us to just, why don't we just say, okay, I'm going to trust in God and let's go for it. it be, why is that so hard? Wow. Well, that's, that's the key because it's, because it takes work. Um, and it takes work because we part, I think often from a really cynical way of looking at life. Um, we, we've been trained in cynicism till we've become masters. And so I think often what we forget is that Jesus is trying to change the disciples' thinking process so the emotional outcomes will be different. In order for you to achieve peace, I need to think and rework your your, the whole way you process thought. Um, But I've been thinking the same way for 37 years, and so that takes a lot of introspection, and it takes a lot of just conscientious observation. Um, So Jesus is saying, look, I know you have all these thoughts about how the kingdom was going to be, and I know you have all these thoughts about who I was supposed to be, and I know that the reality that you are experiencing is causing you quite a bit of anxiety because your thoughts aren't matching up to the picture that you're experiencing trust me. And so it's it's a shift, I think. It's a subtle shift in the way our thinking processes work, but it's one that continues um, to, to require that we closely monitor it. Um, I know these words. I can quote them by heart. I've read them. I've preached on them. I've read countless commentaries on them. Guess what? There are days where my heart is troubled, and that's not a reflection on my spiritual life. There are days when your heart is going to be troubled, and there's not that is not a reflection on your failures in your spiritual life being in shambles. It's a reflection of you being human. And so just like we're asking people to have compassion as servant leaders when they connect with each other, we're also asking you to be compassionate with yourself. Give yourself some time. Pat yourself on the back. It's a long journey. It requires a lot of attention. But don't stay there. Continue moving forward and hoping because that's the good news of the gospel. Remember, he says, I go for to prepare a place. And the Greek word uh, for place is topos, and that's where we get our word topography from. Um, There's another one that that exists, and that's utopos or utopia. That's a place that doesn't exist. That's the literal translation of the word. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, "I, I am going to create a utopia. Jesus says, I am going to open up a real space that you can inhabit. 
So it's okay if sometimes your heart is troubled. Just know that that won't last forever. Jesus is going to, to prepare a place, a place for you to find peace. As we're wrapping up, I think that's such an important point you made there, Miguel, is that there seems to be this kind of idea that when we say, this text says, let not your heart be troubled. So then you need to achieve this task that you're no longer troubled. Instead, it's an appeal when you are troubled, you can come back and Jesus is saying to you again, let not your heart be troubled in this situation. Because he recognizes that we're going to be troubled. In fact, he tells this, and then he knows the disciples are going to be going through a lot of trouble of just it. in his, his cru crucifixion. And all of those experiences, when we keep coming back to him and trusting him, we are drawn closer and closer, and our ability to trust him just increases, increases. So with that, can you close us off with prayer? Absolutely. Let's pray. God, we come to you, and on some occasions our hearts are troubled. And you teach us to have faith and trust. You appeal to us. And so today we want to trust. We want to trust in you, our great teacher. We want to trust that you have gone to prepare a place. And that that place can be accessible, at least in glimpses in the here and now. You have told us that if we have seen you, we have seen the Father. And today we witness that dynamic relationship occurring as the Spirit finds its way into our hearts and moves us into a season of peace even amidst this pandemic. Lord, teach us how to stay in those moments. Lord, if somebody out there is feeling troubled, Please grant them the capacity to know that this will not end, last forever, that there is an end to the pain. And if somebody out there, Lord, is experiencing joy, please allow them to revel in that, in that moment, for that is the presence of the Spirit. Today we close simply by saying, O oh, Captain, O oh, Captain, we stand ready. We stand ready to follow your orders as we breathlessly await the culmination of time so that we may inhabit the place that you have for us. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Mm -hmm.